Hi everyone, my name is Shannon and I'm a consultant at the Writing Center. This is our pre-recorded workshop on understanding plagiarism and citation. If you're not familiar with our other services, we also offer one-to-one -one consultations, uh, both in person in the Writing Center in NBC and online. We do written feedback on your papers. We also offer workshops in real time in addition to our pre-recorded workshops. And there are a number of super helpful writing guides on our website. More information about all of these services can be found at writingcenter.baruch.cuny.edu. So in this workshop, we're going to talk about what plagiarism is, why citation is so important, and the basic mechanics of how to write citations in your paper. Here at the Writing Center, we understand that you are not intending to plagiarize, um, but there is a significant amount of unintentional accidental plagiarism that we see in our work. Um, as a writing center consultant and an instructor over the course of the last 10 years, I have seen a lot of plagiarism. I think 99.9% .9 of it was entirely unintentional. Um, I really know that most students do not intend to steal, have no idea that they are actually plagiarizing. Um, and we're often told, just don't steal, don't buy a paper online, and it'll be fine. You're not plagiarizing, right? But in reality, plagiarism is a lot more complicated. Uh, usually, it happens when people don't quite understand what they need to cite or how they need to cite it. And so we're going to talk a lot today about the underlying values behind why citation matters so much. Um, how to recognize when you need to cite and how to make sure you are doing that appropriately. So first we're going to take a look at a few examples of sources and the way that writers have used those sources. And for each of the examples that we look at, we're going to pause and consider, is this plagiarism or not? So in this first case study, we see on the left-hand side, the text from the original source, and on the right-hand side, we see the way the writer used it in their paper. So the source says, the concept of systems is really quite simple. The basic idea is that a system has parts that fit together to make a whole, but where it gets complicated and interesting is how these parts are connected or related to each other. And we've provided the citation for the source at the bottom. We see that it came from a writer named Frick. It was published in a periodical um, in 1991. The writer who found this source wrote the following sentence. A system has parts that fit together to make a whole, but the important aspect of systems is how those parts are connected or related to each other. So, Given what you know about plagiarism, take a moment, pause the video, and consider, did the writer plagiarize? So contrary to what you might expect, this is an example of plagiarism. Most students who look at this say, no, it's not plagiarized because they gave credit to the source, right? We do see a citation at the end of the sentence. They provide the last name of the author and the year of publication. However, the student copied word for word from the original and did not use quotation marks around the borrowed text. So if we look at this a little bit more closely, we see that in the original, it says a system has parts that fit together to make a whole. The student used exactly that same language. A system has parts that fit together to make a whole. And they also use this second phrase, is how those parts are connected or related to each other. We see that same phrase appearing in the writer's text as well. And so this brings to light a super important aspect of plagiarism, right? Is that if you are using ideas and or language from the original text, you absolutely must give credit not only to the idea, but also to the language, right? So if you don't put quotation marks around a phrase that you took from a text and you're only putting a citation at the end, right? It suggests that you wrote the sentence, that the idea came from 
the original text, but that you actually crafted the sentence on your own, right? Um, but you have to give credit to the author, not only for the concept, but also for the work that they did to craft that sentence, right? And so if you're pulling a phrase, you, you note to the reader that you have taken that phrase that someone else wrote by putting quotation marks around it, okay? So that's the first option that this writer could use to correct this citation and make sure that they're not plagiarizing, right? So in this first example, corrected version number one, we see the writer using quotation and APA citation. Frick 1991 states that a system has parts that fit together to make a whole, and they've put quotation marks around that. But the important aspect of systems is how those parts are connected or related to each other. So people often think that if you're going to provide a quote, you have to quote the entire sentence, um, but you actually don't. If you're taking a phrase from the text, you can simply put quotes around that phrase and integrate it in a grammatically correct way into the rest of your sentence. And it does qualify as a perfectly acceptable quote, right? And so in this first example, we see the writer doing two really important things. They're giving credit to the idea right, um, by using the author's last name in APA citation style, which we'll talk about a little bit more uh, towards the end of the workshop. You include the year of publication and also the page number, right? So they're giving all of the necessary information, making it clear where the idea comes from. They're also using quotes to denote that they're taking some language that was crafted by the original author. The other option, if you don't want to use a whole bunch of quotes, would be to paraphrase. So a paraphrase is when you put something into your own words. So let's take a look at the example given here. Frick 1991 states that to understand systems, it is illuminating to study not only the separate parts that comprise a system, but also the relationship between these component parts. So we see that in this paraphrase, the idea from the original text is still there and the writer is still giving credit for it, right? They're making it clear who said this, who came up with this. Um, but they decided that they didn't want to use the, any of the author's original language, so they put it in their own words. Um, and putting it in your own words means really using your own vocabulary, your own sentence structure, your own syntax, that's word order, in order to explain the idea. So the way that I often think about a successful paraphrase is that it's not just changing a couple words around, right? And we'll look at that in a minute. Um, but it's really, if you were to explain an idea separate from the text, you close the book, you walk away and explain it, how would you explain it in an accurate way? That's a paraphrase, right? So imagine that you're studying, you go out for coffee with a friend, they ask you what you're reading about, what you're learning about, and you might say something like, well, this guy Frick says that to understand systems, it's illuminating to study not only the separate parts, but also the relationships between those parts, right? So that's a little bit more formal than you might actually speak to a friend over coffee, right? But you are really using your own language, your own sentence structure in order to explain that, right? And so that's what we consider to be putting something into your own words, right? A successful paraphrase, something that truly is explained in your own way. And so when you do that, you don't have to put quotes around any of the language because this time you've crafted the language, but you do still have to provide the citation to show where the idea came from. So we're going to take a look at another case study. So same thing. On the left, we've got the source, and on the right, we've got what the writer said. So the source says, the form of military compensation also limits the ability of military families to adapt to financial crises, potentially forcing them to turn to creditors. Much of military compensation comes in the form of non-fungible in-kind goods and services rather than a traditional paycheck. Military health care, future tuition assistance, military housing, military food, access to commissaries, and access to military recreational facilities and entertainment 
are all important components of the compensation package for military personnel. Military recruiters understandably use these side benefits as a way of explaining and justifying relatively low military pay. Nevertheless, the non-fungible nature of non-cash compensation prevents military personnel from converting a significant portion of their resources to overcome income shocks and unexpected expenses. And so here we've provided another reference list citation for the source that was written by someone named Graves, someone named Peterson in 2005. The writer who read this then wrote the following. Besides the problem of low wages, however, military members are also faced with the reality that much of their compensation is not paid in cash. While civilians can allot their cash earnings to pay for, say, car repairs, a military household cannot convert their illiquid medical housing food or tuition assistance benefits into cash to cover unexpected expenses. As a result, many military personnel find that the amount and the type of compensation they receive are not conducive to smoothing temporary spikes in expenditures. So take a minute, pause the video, and consider, based on what we just learned about the previous case study, would this qualify as plagiarism? So this might surprise you, but this does qualify as plagiarism. And the reason for that is that even if you paraphrase exceptionally well, um, which I would say this is a very strong paraphrase because it really is the same ideas, it's accurate to the original text, but it is put in a different syntax, different sentence structure, right? It's really using the writer's own words explained in their own way, but they are not citing the source, right? Graves and Peterson are not mentioned anywhere in this passage. We don't see an in-text citation. And so in some ways, this is the opposite problem of what we saw in case study number one, where they were providing a citation for the ideas, but there was no citation uh, or no quotation giving credit to the language that they took. Here, they didn't take any language, but they also didn't give credit for paraphrasing. So sometimes people think that you only need to give credit for quotations, but that's not true. This is where, again, it's plagiarism is taking language and or ideas from a text without giving credit, right? And so it's really important that even if you're providing just the ideas, but not taking any of the language, in other words, paraphrasing, but not quoting, that you still provide an in-text citation to give credit for the concept that you learned about from the text. So as we see in the previous example, unsighted paraphrasing is a form of plagiarism. And make sure that when you use a source in a paper, that you provide a citation in two places in the paper. So the first thing is that you're going to want to provide an in-text citation or footnote. And whether you provide an in-text citation, a parenthetical, like we saw in uh, case study number one, or whether you provide a footnote will depend on the citation style you're using, and we'll talk more about that towards the end of the workshop. But basically, an in-text citation uh, or a footnote is a brief citation found in the physical text of a paper, right? So the reader reads the sentence where the information or language from the source appears, and they see right away, oh, okay, this is which source it comes from, right? But you also have to provide a works cited page or bibliography. Again, the terminology for these depends on which citation style you're using, but basically works cited, bibliography, they're a reference list. Uh, at the end of the paper, you provide a list of the full publication information for each source you cited. And so these work really well together because basically what the in-text citations do, in addition to making it clear where the ideas from a source end and your analysis or thoughts or responses begin, they also provide a little bit of a guide or a roadmap to which source in the reference list information came from, right? If there's no in-text citation, then we don't, not only do we not know where you're using information from sources and where you're providing your own ideas, 
But we also have no way of understanding which sources from the reference list are being addressed in each sentence, right? If there's no reference list and only in-text citations, then the in-text citations often aren't enough information for the reader to then look up the source if they want to double check or simply find out more information. So let's look at another case study. In this one, the original source says, so in Romeo and Juliet, understandably in view of its early date, we cannot find that tragedy has fully emerged from the moral drama and the romantic comedy that dominated in the public theaters of Shakespeare's earliest time. Here, he attempted an amalgam of romantic comedy and the tragic idea, along with the assertion of a moral lesson, which is given the final emphasis, although the force of that lesson is switched from the lovers to their parents. And this was written by someone named Clifford Leach in an article called The Moral Tragedy of Romeo and Juliet. So the writer said, in his essay, The Moral Tragedy of Romeo and Juliet, Clifford Leach suggests that rather than being a straight tragedy, Romeo and Juliet is a mixture of romantic comedy and the tragic idea, and that it asserts a moral lesson, which is given the final emphasis. The impact of the moral lesson is switched from the lovers to the parents. So take a minute, pause the video, take a look at these highlighted phrases and consider whether this would constitute plagiarism. So in this case, this actually is also an example of plagiarism because the writer is using words and sentence structures from the original text without quoting or paraphrasing them. So oftentimes people will look at this example and say, but yeah, there are some similar phrases here, right? But the writer did change them at least a little bit. So we look at amalgam of romantic comedy and the tragic idea becomes mixture of romantic comedy and the tragic idea. Assertion of a moral lesson becomes asserts a moral lesson. Um, Although the force of that lesson is switched from the lovers to the parents, the beginning of that is different. The impact of the moral lesson is switched from the lovers to the parents. This is called patch writing, which is a type of insufficient paraphrase. So this is something that happens all the time when somebody is operating in good faith. It's a really common type of accidental plagiarism. You're trying not to plagiarize, you're trying to paraphrase, um, but you maybe just open up your thesaurus, switch a word, or adjust the grammar a little bit into a different tense, right? Or maybe some of the sentence is different, but there's a whole phrase, like a good little like four or five word chunk that's exactly the same. That technically is plagiarism because you're still not really crafting the language on your own. So if you remember what I said was a really good example of paraphrasing um, in both the first and second case studies, that's the person who closed the book, went for coffee with a friend, and was able to explain it to them really in their own words, right? That's crafting the language on your own. If you're not actually crafting the language on your own, writing a new sentence and sentence structure, using different words to explain the, the same idea, then you need to provide credit to the original author for crafting that sentence because they really did the work in that. So an effective paraphrase demonstrates your understanding of the source without using the original author's language or sentence structure. And this is where um, comprehension really plays into paraphrasing, where it's really impossible uh, to go through that process that I described of walking away from the text and explaining it to a friend if you don't really understand what the text is saying. So oftentimes when I see patch writing, it's often an example of someone not totally understanding what the text is saying. And so they just switch around a couple words and I hope it works, right? Um, so you really want to make sure that you are truly comprehending anything that you're quoting, not only because that makes for a stronger argument, you want to make sure that you understand all of your evidence so that you can analyze it appropriately, 
but also because a strong paraphrase is a way of demonstrating your reading comprehension to your professor uh, by being able to explain it in your own terms. An ineffective paraphrase or patch writing might delete a few words, change a few grammatical structures or plug in synonyms, but it's not really doing the work of crafting that sentence or phrase on its own. It can also suggest that there's maybe some missing comprehension happening between the writer and the original source text. If you have more questions about effective paraphrasing, we do offer a workshop on summarizing, paraphrasing, and quoting that goes into the process of paraphrasing effectively more thoroughly. And I do strongly recommend that because it's super helpful in informing the way that you're avoiding plagiarism in your own work. So one more case study. In this one, the source says, from time to time, this submerged or latent theater in Hamlet becomes almost overt. It is close to the surface in Hamlet's pretense of madness, the quote, antic disposition he puts on to protect himself and prevent his antagonist from plucking out the heart of his mystery. It is even closer to the surface when Hamlet enters his mother's room and holds up side by side the pictures of the two kings, old Hamlet and Claudius, and proceeds to describe for her the true nature of the choice she has made, presenting truth by means of a show. So we see even in, in this original text, the writer has chosen to, the, the author, Alvin Kernan, has chosen to quote a phrase that he took from somewhere else. Um, he's letting us know that it came from somewhere, presumably in the original text, there's also a footnote of some kind, an in-text citation to show us where that came from. But he's doing that work of saying, oh, there's this really amazing phrase that I can't really express in my own words, maybe without losing meaning. So I'm going to put that in, but I'm going to make sure that I use those quotes. Okay. But the writer, the student writer, read the Alvin Kernan source and was using it in their paper. And here's what they wrote. Almost all of Shakespeare's Hamlet can be understood as a play about acting and the theater. For example, in act one, Hamlet pretends to be insane in order to make sure his enemies do not discover his mission to revenge his father's murder. The theme is even more obvious when Hamlet compares the pictures of his mother's two husbands to show her what a bad choice she has made, using their images to reveal the truth. So. One more time, pause the video and consider, is this plagiarism or not? So surprise, surprise, it's another example of plagiarism. So even though they have paraphrased Kernan's words, they've borrowed the author's argument and examples without citation. So this is similar to the second case study in that it's, it's an okay paraphrase, it's not the best. We'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide. But ultimately, even if it were a really good paraphrase, we would still need an in-text citation in order to demonstrate, hey, this idea, this analysis came from somewhere. So again, taking ideas and information from a source without crediting it is plagiarism. So even though almost nothing of Kernan's original language remains, the key idea, the choice, the order of examples, and the basic structure of the original sentences are all taken from this source. So this is why it's not as strong of a paraphrase, and perhaps it would have been better for the writer to simply provide a quote, whether it's just a quote of a, a key phrase or even a sentence, um, because they're, they're using their own words, but they're still kind of using Kernan's sentence structure. The order of information and examples is almost exactly the same. This probably doesn't pass the going out to coffee with a friend test, right? And even if they did all of that, they would still need to provide a citation to emphasize, hey, these ideas, this analysis came from someone else. So this raises some questions about what we cite, what we don't need to cite, how to cite, and also why citation is so valued. So let's take a look at some really clear guidelines on what needs to be cited, what doesn't need to be cited, and then we'll think a little bit about what are the underlying values informing this, and what are the processes professors use in order to make sure that you're not plagiarizing. 
So because the purpose of college writing is learning, students are held to a high standard when it comes to academic integrity. So I like to think about any writing assignment that you receive as a kind of assessment, right? We think about assessments as just being tests and quizzes, but essays are another form of assessment. And so your professor, when they assign you a piece of writing, they're assessing your comprehension of course concepts or reading. They're also assessing your writing skills. And finally, they're assessing any kinds of other skills like critical thinking skills, analytical skills, interpretive skills that they have been working on with you in class. And so a big part of citation is being able to demonstrate your research ability and also your ability to analyze text. And in order to do that, we need to be able to differentiate source material from your own thinking and, and writing, right? And so Baruch's definition of plagiarism aligns with this. You can find this on the Baruch College website. Their academic integrity statement is a little bit longer and more thorough than this. It also outlines um, penalties for plagiarism, but the real definition is as follows. According to the Baruch administration, plagiarism is the act of presenting another person's ideas, research, or writing as your own. This includes, but is not limited to, copying another person's actual words without the use of quotation marks and footnotes. So we saw that in uh, case study number one presenting another person's ideas or theories in your own words without acknowledging them, case study number two, using information that is not considered common knowledge without acknowledging the source. So common knowledge generally is what you could reasonably expect your reader to know. We'll talk about that more in a couple of slides. Failure to acknowledge collaborators on homework and laboratory assignments. We'll also discuss the ins and outs of that in a minute and purchase and submission of papers from paper mills, internet vendor sites, and other sources. So this, as I said at the beginning, is what people often think of when they think about plagiarism, right? Is buying a paper from another student or from the internet. Um, I once had a student submit me what seemed to just be a copy pasted version of the Wikipedia entry on Romeo and Juliet. Um, but as I said, that is so, so, so rare. Uh, because for the most part, students really are operating in good faith, trying not to plagiarize. But what happens in these first four bullet points is actually really common. So we're going to take a look now at a handout on what to cite and what not to cite. This is also on our website, but we're going to go over it together uh, for, for the purposes of this workshop. So what you have to cite and what you do not have to cite include, you have to cite another person's ideas or interpretations. So as we saw in the fourth case study, you must provide a citation whenever you discuss someone else's thoughts, research, or analysis. That fourth case study was some was Kernan's analysis of Hamlet, right? Even though it wasn't raw data, it was someone else's idea, so it needed a citation. You must cite verbatim language taken from a source. So this includes all direct quotes, except in the rare case that the quote is considered common knowledge. So for example, if you're citing a very well-known quotation from JFK's inaugural address, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country, you do need to provide quotes because that's JFK's language, but you don't need to provide a source other than JFK himself. So you could say something like, as John F. K. Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country, right? But you don't need to provide a specific source for where you found that information because it's reasonably understood that your reader knows that this was JFK. As we'll talk about a little bit more in a sec, if you are, however, uncertain about whether a quote is common knowledge, you should just cite it. You also have to cite words, ideas, or material that originate somewhere outside of you. So this is sort of the umbrella rule, right? If it didn't come from you, provide a citation. 
This could be content presented in a magazine, a book, newspaper, song, TV program, movie, web page, computer program, letter, advertisement, presentation, speech, in-class lecture, or any other medium. Right. This includes, as we say later in the list, visual materials like diagrams and illustrations or electronic media such as uh, images, audio, video. Anything you didn't make yourself needs a citation for it. People often ask, well, how do I cite those things? I will show you how to use the tools to figure that out later in this workshop. You also need to provide a citation for information gained through interviewing or talking to another person. So if you conduct your own interview, even if it's a phone call, face-to-face -face conversation, or even an email, you do need to provide a citation noting who is the person that you emailed, right? Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how you can find out how to cite that information at the end of the workshop. Finally, you do need to provide a citation for any collaboration with classmates or under, other individuals that has not been pre-approved by your instructor. So in group projects or lab work, it's important to be clear on what work was done independently, what work was done collaboratively. Um, usually, if your professor recommends a collaboration, like, hey, go to the writing center, then you don't need to provide a citation for that. But if you're ever uncertain about whether you're allowed to collaborate on something and whether your professor wants you to provide a citation for that, just ask your instructor. What you don't have to cite, common knowledge. So as I said earlier, common knowledge is information that is commonly known that you can reasonably expect your reader to already be familiar with. It doesn't need to be cited because it's not attributable to one source. If you're trying to figure out whether you need to cite something because it might be common knowledge, consider your reader because it often depends on cultural context and the discipline that you're writing in. So information that would be considered common knowledge in certain countries might not be common knowledge in others. Similarly, common knowledge in one discipline might not be generally known in other disciplines. So if you are writing for a business class and you're referring to a concept that is widely used in business classes and uh, management materials, you can probably just refer to it as if it's common knowledge if you're writing for a business audience. If, however, you are applying that for a psychology class, you might not be able to get away with assuming it's common knowledge because a reader in the psychology discipline might not understand what that is, okay? Um, it's also important to remember that just because you just know something doesn't necessarily mean that it is common knowledge. So something that you know but don't remember where you learned it might not be something that any reader could be reasonably expected to know. So for example, if I grew up in a family where my parents were therapists and talked about psychological concepts over the dinner table, I might know a lot about Freud that's just hanging out in my head, but I can't necessarily assume that my reader would know that that, that, that information is true or it comes from a reliable source. And so if that's the case, if there's something that I just know, but I'm not sure whether a reader would necessarily also know it, then I just need to look it up, find a reliable source for it, and cite that source. So again, if you're ever in doubt about whether information is common or knowledge or not, just go ahead and cite it. It's always better to oversight than undersight, all right? Because there's no penalty uh, for oversighting. Um, also note with common knowledge, if you're sure that something is common knowledge, but you're using specific language or sentence structure from a source to convey those facts, then the source for that language must be cited, right? So if you're talking about how the molecular structure for water is H2O, but you're borrowing a phrase from a text in order to explain that, somebody else crafted that language, and so you need to put quotes around it. Um, and provide the citation for that language if you want to use the language, okay? You also, of course, don't have to cite your own lived experiences, including observations, insights, thoughts, conclusions about a subject. Your analysis of evidence is not something that needs to be cited, provided that it is independent analysis. 
and your own original research, such as results obtained through lab or field experiments. If it's a lab report and you got a particular result, right, that's knowledge that you generated, so you don't need to provide a citation for that. So overall, what you do need to cite are any ideas, phrasing, data, or work that originates outside of you, even if you rephrase it, or even if you disagree with the source. If it came from somewhere else, you have to provide a citation. What you don't need to cite are your own ideas. You may need to cite collaboration with another individual, um, such as working with a lab partner or a writing center consultant, but it really depends on what your professor said you can collaborate on and whether they're asking you to provide citations for those collaborations. If you ever have questions about what type of help is authorized, whether a citation is needed, just ask your instructor. They'll really respect you coming forward and asking about that. So this is a good time to pause and think about why these guidelines exist why citation is valued, why your professors want you to consult and, and cite sources, right? Um, as I'm sure you've observed from the last however many slides, there is a much greater emphasis put on citation and avoiding plagiarism in academic writing than in other kinds of writing and communication. So for example, if an NBA player wants to write a memoir and they hire a ghostwriter to write it for them. The ghostwriter's name doesn't appear on the front page of the book, um, but it's not considered plagiarism, right? Similarly, if you are in a work environment and you collaboratively write a memo with a couple of coworkers to give to your boss, you don't have to really clearly designate who wrote what. And so there are underlying values that inform why it's so important in academia and why it's not as important in other contexts, right? And ultimately, this is important because one, as everybody knows, you want to be fair to whoever wrote your sources, right? Um, everybody knows don't steal, right? Give credit, be fair, be honest, operate in good faith. But beyond that, um, if we think again about how the purpose of academic writing is to assess your thinking and your skills, right, then it's really important for you to make it clear where someone else's ideas end and your ideas begin so that your professor can do some of that assessment of your thinking and your writing skills, right? In the case of the NBA player who hires a ghostwriter for his memoir, Nobody really cares whether or not he has good writing skills. They're interested in reading about how he developed his basketball skills, right? But the purpose of an academic paper is different. And so in order for your professor to use it as a successful assessment of your skills, of your knowledge, then they need to be able to differentiate where someone else's ideas end and, and language ends and where yours begin, right? The other thing is that your professors want you to consult and cite sources in order to become part of an academic conversation. Every topic under the sun has a so-called conversation in academia on it, right? It's people who are either overtly or implicitly responding to each other, building on each other's ideas, asking questions to engage on the same topic, right? And when you write an academic paper, you are understanding that conversation so that you can enter the conversation and add your own perspective that's usually drawn from research and the analysis of evidence, right? And so by providing citations, you enable your professors to see where you're getting your ideas, not only for giving credit, but also to see how you are understanding and engaging in that conversation. And Ultimately, any academic paper ideally serves as a resource for other people who are interested in learning about the topic. And so if you are accurately citing your sources, as I described earlier when I was talking about the importance of having both in-text citations and a reference list, you want your paper to be a resource for someone who's reading along. In the middle of a paragraph, they say, wow, that's a really interesting idea. I want to learn more about that. 
And so they follow your in-text citation, find the source in the reference list, and then go check out that source so that they can learn more. This is hopefully how you're doing some of your research, right? Not only reading a text, but also paying attention to the sources it cites so you can find further information. But also, it's the way that everyone conducts research, right? It's how we all learn about new topics by following this web of information from each other's citations. Ultimately, you're going to have a lot harder time writing successful citations if you're not being careful about how you're conducting your research. So there are strategies for using sources and managing your sources while you're researching that can be incredibly helpful to help you keep track so that you are citing appropriately at the end, right? Um, I know that we've all probably been in that situation where you've put off a paper until the last minute, something I do not recommend, but have done myself, where I'm writing at three in the morning, it's finally done, it's due at 9 a.m., I just want to go to bed, and I realize, oh my gosh, I forgot my citation, right? And then what do I have to do? I'm completely exhausted, and I have to go back and find where I got all of that information. That is a recipe for plagiarism, right? Not because I'm trying to plagiarize, but because I'm exhausted, I'm overlooking things, and I'm having to do this whole layer of work at the very end, right? And even if it's not 3 a.m. and you've given yourself plenty of time, it's still something that can cause a lot of mistakes in the citation and is ultimately just a headache. So it's important to think about how you can keep track of your sources while you're doing research and while you're writing to prevent those kinds of problems along the way. So one thing that I recommend is to take notes as you research instead of just sort of passively taking in any material that you're reading. This is a really good rule of thumb just for reading comprehension as well. As you're taking notes, color code to distinguish between quotes, paraphrases, summaries, and your own ideas. So oftentimes when I'm researching, I make sure that if I'm copying the exact language out of a text, I put quotes around it so I don't forget that it's a quote later, right? If I'm paraphrasing, I might highlight that in a certain color so that I know, okay, that's a, that's a paraphrase I can use, right? Um, a summary, which is where you're basically boiling down all of the ideas in an entire text. If I'm summarizing in my notes, I color code that. So I know how to attribute it and how to characterize it, right? Because I might introduce a paraphrase slightly different from a summary when I'm actually doing my, my writing uh, because the summary would be the whole idea from a text as opposed to just something that a writer, may, maybe one of their supporting points or some evidence that they're providing. And I'll often put my own ideas, whether it's my responses, my questions, my analysis, in a separate color so that I can keep track of that. The source and your response to it. Something that you could do would be to color code. You could also create like a little graph. Sometimes people will have two columns where they've got the information that they got from a source. And for each information piece of information, they might have a little bit of analysis or a little bit of response, right? So that they're distinguishing between what's in the source and what am I saying in response to that. Also, record citation information as you read. This is crucial so that you avoid that problem that I described where you have a great paper, but you don't remember where each of the pieces of information came from, right? So there's a super helpful and free tool called Zotero that you can use to keep track of all of your sources. I do recommend that you look that up and create an account. It has a lot of really helpful tools for helping you keep track of where information comes from while you're researching. Uh, and ultimately, this will mean that when you sit down to write your work cited list, you'll have all the information ready to go, and you won't have like 200 tabs open that you've had open for the last week while you've been writing the paper, because that's also a really, it's just a difficult way to live. So I highly recommend Zotero as an alternative to that. Also, get to know the basic format of citation styles expected in your classes. So make sure that you know what kind of citation your professor wants. Do they want MLA style, APA style, or one of the Chicago styles? And once you have a sense of that, just be familiar with, in general, what does MLA 
or APA look like? And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Make sure that you don't rely on EasyBib or other auto-generated citations. Even uh, like um, Google Scholar and other uh, academic web pages and databases will often have auto-generated citation options, but even those often make mistakes. So I wish that there were one really simple place that you could plug in a citation and know with 100% confidence that you're going to get an accurate citation out of it. But ultimately, I see so many errors all the time in a reference list that students have used an auto-generated citation for. And so it's really important that you try to write your own citation, or at the very least, if you're using auto-generated citation, that you know how to check its work. I'm going to give you some tools and some resources that you can use to make sure that you can write your own citation and or double check and revise whatever an auto-generated citation machine gives you, but definitely don't rely on one of those on its own. They often give you the wrong thing. Okay, so let's talk about the actual nuts and bolts of creating citation. So we're going to Take a look at a guide to practice formatting citations and learn the difference between citation styles. So before we get into what these actually look like, a couple notes about the difference between MLA, APA, and Chicago style citations. So these are different styles for citation format. Regardless of what discipline you're working in, what class you're taking, you have to provide citation in every class. But based on the discipline, your professor might ask you to use a different style for citation. These are kind of like different languages or grammars for citation. They have their own rules for what order the information should come in, what the in-text citation should look like, and what the reference list citation should look like. Um, and they're usually used in certain disciplines. So for example, MLA is often used in English classes. We see, for example, here that the in-text citation in MLA format is Pepper 49. This is the author's last name and the page number. If the writer is coming from an English or humanities discipline, they understand and will be looking for the last name and the page number. If they're coming from another discipline, they might be looking for the last name and the year of publication. So you're basically operating in the citation language that is common in a particular discipline. Okay. Um, so MLA is often used in the humanities mostly because it highlights the author's last name, the page number, whereas APA, which stands for American Psychological Association, whereas MLA is Modern Language Association, is used more in the social sciences. And we see that that uses the author's last name, the year, and the page number. And the year becomes more important in the social sciences, where a lot of the work is being done much more currently, and it's a lot more time-based, right? So if you're writing a paper in psychology, it matters a lot whether you're using uh, information from 1961 or 2021 because our understanding of psychology has changed drastically in that time, right? And so in this way, it's not just what a reader in a certain discipline is expecting to see, it's also that the citations reflect the values of that, that discipline. So be careful, just make sure that you know which citation file your professor is requiring in a certain class. If it doesn't say on the syllabus or in the instructions for an essay, just ask, okay? But either way, it's a good idea to familiarize yourself with the what a citation looks like, both in text and in a reference list for each of these styles, so that you can start to differentiate for yourself and sort of get into the habit and make it a little bit more intuitive as you're writing these citations. Um, one thing to note is that pretty much nobody has all of the exact citation formats for 
every single type of source in every single citation style memorized, right? There might be a couple people out there who have decided that it's their, it's going to be like their thing, right? They know every single format, in-text, and reference list for every citation style for every kind of source, right? But the thing is that you have four main citation styles, MLA, APA, Chicago Notes Bibliography, and Chicago Author Date. They all have different formats. And so for a printed book, you would cite in four different ways, depending on whether you're using MLA, APA, Chicago Notes Bibliography, or Chicago Author Date. And moreover, each type of source has different sets of publication information, right? So if it, you found it on a website, for example, you're going to need a different citation format for, than you would for a printed book because there's different information. There's when it was posted, there's the URL, right? And so every type of source has its own particular formatting guidelines and those formatting guidelines will change depending on the style, right? So do not expect yourself to know exactly by heart every single citation format for every type of source in every style. That's not fair to you. Um, but do have a general sense of the patterns that are sort of the, the rule in each citation style so that you're not accidentally veering into a different style when you're creating your citations, and also understand how to use your resources so that you know, okay, here's how to check my work. Or as I mentioned earlier, if you have an unusual source, right? Like let's say you did a, your own interview with someone and you need to cite that, know how to find examples and guidelines for how to provide those citations. And I'll show you that at the end of the workshop. For now, Let's take a look at examples of in-text citations for a printed book in all four citation styles so that you can see roughly how they differ and what the particular values are for each of these citation styles. So in MLA, we see this sentence. This phenomenon is best referred to as a cumulative collaboration of evidence. And then we have Pepper 49. So in MLA, the guidelines for an in-text citation for a printed book are the last name of the author and the page number. In APA, we see this phenomenon is best referred to as a cumulative collaboration of evidence. And then in the parentheses, we have Pepper 1961 P.49. So the template here is last name, year of publication, P. Dot, and page number, okay? People often make the mistake, they're overlooking the details, right? And so they might be told by their professor, you need to cite this paper in APA, and they'll omit the page number, or they'll omit the year, right? And then you have something, so if you said pepper, comma, p.49, you're now citing in no style, right? Because you've got the commas from APA, the p. Dot from APA, so it doesn't fit into MLA because MLA is just the last name and the page number, no punctuation, right? But you're not including the year, so it's not APA either, right? So detail orientation is really important, and I highly recommend that you reserve at least one round of proofreading just to look at your citations and make sure that they're correct, because all the time, I'll, as an instructor, I'll tell my students, cite an MLA and I see commas or years or P dot and then the page numbers hanging out. And technically, even though it's not plagiarism because you're still providing a citation, it is incorrect and you could get marked off. And it's just a good idea whenever you're participating in any conversation to understand and operate within the conventions of that conversation. So it's a good idea to give it its own separate read and make sure that you are um, checking each of those citations and ensuring that they're operating within the style that you've been assigned to work in. So Chicago Notes Bibliography, this is where we use footnotes. So the example here is this phenomenon is best referred to as a cumulative collaboration of evidence. We see the little number at the end of the sentence. And then at the end of that very page where this sentence appeared, 
we would see in the footnote, Stephen C. Pepper, World Hypothesis, parentheses, Los Angeles, colon, University of California Press, comma, 1961, parentheses, comma, 49, period, right? So this is kind of like a, a more um, thorough, there's more of the publication information here, and it appears at the very bottom of the same page where you use the quote. And let's say that you had four citations on that page, the, you would have them each numbered so that at the bottom of the page, the reader could say, okay, one refers to Stephen C. Pepper, two refers to somebody else, and so on, okay? And so when you're providing a footnote in Chicago Notes Bibliography, you use the first name, the last name, the book title, always italicized book title, and then in parentheses, the place of publication with a colon, the press, the publisher, comma, year, parentheses again, comma, and then the page number with the period, okay? Again, this seems super idiosyncratic, but you wanna make sure that you're doing this correctly instead of having different versions of the format hanging out in different spots, okay? And then we've got Chicago author date. So this one is a little simpler, a lot simpler maybe than Chicago Notes Bibliography. This says, this phenomenon is best referred to as a cumulative collaboration of evidence, a simple parenthetical citation. We've got Pepper, 1961, and then the page number, okay? So you can use this, and there's a handout with these uh, guidelines on it on our website as well. You can use this as examples of roughly what an in-text citation for a common type of source, a printed book might look like. Let's take a look at what these reference list citations would look like. So in MLA, we've got Condon, Frankie, uh, and then uh, in French, c'est impossible, impossible n'est pas français. Uh, so that's the title of the article. Uh, the Writing Center Journal, volume 36, number one, 2017, pages 217 to 234, JSTOR, and then the URL. So the template for this is, and this is for a page from a web journal. We're not working with a book now, but it's last name, first name, the title of the article, the journal title, the volume number, the, the number number. So usually in, a, in a, um, a web journal or a printed periodical, there will be volumes and then numbers of issues. And you want to include both. The year of publication, the pages that it appeared in. So if this is in a journal, right? Then there may be 50 pages in the journal and this particular article is only, it looks like a, about like 15 or 16 of them, right? And then you have the site name where you found it, right? In this case, JSTOR, which is an online database and then the URL so that the reader can go directly to that site if they want to find the article, okay? In APA, we can see it looks a little bit different. Condon, F, 2017, parentheses. C'est impossible, impossible n'est pas français. Review of other people's English. The Writing Center Journal, 361-217-234, and then the URL. So the guideline here is that we have the last name and then the first initial of the author's name, but not their whole first name. Then period, the year in parentheses, period, the title of the article, not in quotation, unlike with MLA, right? Then the journal title, journal titles like books are always going to be italicized. Then uh, we've got the volume number, the number, number in parentheses, the page numbers and the range, right? And then the URL, okay? Um, and in Chicago Notes Bibliography, we've got the last name, the first name, the title of the article, the journal title, the number, or the volume number, but without VOL, just the volume number, and then the number, uh, the issue number, the year, a colon, and the page range, and then the URL. So 
we can see the pattern here, right? It's all the same information. It's just appearing in slightly different orders with different punctuation. And then in Chicago author date, we've got the last name, the first name, the year, the title of the article, the journal title, the volume number, the issue number, the page range, and the URL. Okay, so again, these guidelines are on the handout, so you don't have to rush to print it out or to copy it down right now, although you certainly can pause the video if you would like to. These are examples of how even though we've got the same ingredients, it's still a different set of formatting, right? Slightly different orders, slightly different punctuation. And so it's important to familiarize yourself with this. Even I would look at this. And even though if you ask me, okay, Shannon, tell me from memory, what is the exact template for the reference list for an APA citation of a page from a web journal, right? I wouldn't be able to tell you. But if I looked at this, right? If a student brought this to me and said, my professor wants me to cite in MLA style, and I looked at this, this second one, right? Condon F 2017, I have a general sense that, okay, the year of publication is highly valued in APA citation. It comes at the beginning of the citation. This looks like it's probably an APA citation. Let's look this up and double check, make sure you're doing it right for MLA, okay? And it's important that you have some literacy in these patterns so that you can catch those mistakes of your own before you turn in a paper as well. So overall, um, and we'll talk about uh, a couple of the resources that you can use to double check that in a second, but overall, I want to emphasize a helpful checklist that you should run yourself through and thinking about before you submit a paper with sources. So ask yourself, have I used in-text citations or footnotes to show which parts of this paper are my own and which are ideas or language taken from another writer? Have I paraphrased entirely in my own words using my own structure for ideas? Have I used quotation marks around any words taken directly from a source? Have I cited in the appropriate style? In other words, have I used MLA, APA, or Chicago according to my professor's instructions and the conventions of my discipline? Have I included a bibliography or work cited page? Have I followed my professor's guidelines for what work must be done independently and what work can be done collaboratively if this is for a group project? Have I submitted original work, not work written for me, even if I have the permission of the person who wrote it and not work, I have already turned in for another course. Have I credited any outside assistance I received, including the ideas of fellow classmates or a private tutor or any other conversation my re professor requires me to cite? So as I said at the beginning, we often think that plagiarism is just a simple matter of don't steal, right? but it actually involves all of these things, making sure that you're paying attention to each of these elements of your paper to ensure that not only are you not stealing, right? Which of course you're not wanting to do, but that you are citing correctly, that you're citing everywhere you need to, and that you're abiding by the conventions of your discipline in order to do that. So let's take a look at the biggest and best resource that you can use to make sure that you are paying attention to your correctness of the citation. So this is the Purdue Online Writing Lab. People often refer to it as the OWL at Purdue. Um, and you can find it at just owl.purdue.edu. So this is their homepage. Um, and this is put out by Purdue University. They have a number of super helpful writing guides on all different topics, but the one that I want to show you today within the Purdue OWL, so if you go to the homepage, click on Purdue OWL, um, they have all of the most up-to-date information for the current citation styles for each style, for MLA, APA, Chicago. It's all on their website. So when I was in college, Every year, I would have to buy this 
spiral bound updated guide to MLA file or APA file. And every year they would update it because the types of sources are constantly changing, especially now more than ever, as new technologies appear, you may find yourself wanting to cite a TikTok, which wasn't even imaginable five years ago, right? So they're always updating the styles based on new types of sources and what seems to work best in the discipline. And it used to be that you would have to buy one of these guides every year. But now we have the OWL at Purdue, um, which puts it all in one helpful place. So on the left-hand side of their page, we see that they have an MLA guide, an APA guide, and a Chicago guide, which includes both types of Chicago style mm -hmm. citations. So this is your ultimate resource for making sure that you are citing correctly using in-text citations or reference lists using the, the right format regardless of what type of source you've got, right? So let's say that you are hoping to cite your paper in MLA style. Click on MLA guide, and they have a really helpful um, overview and workshop if you wanna learn more about the ins and outs of that particular style um, and a general style guide. But what's really helpful is over on the left-hand side of this page, we've got MLA formatting and style guide, and they've broken it down by in-text citations, some general formatting, like how would you format a list, a quotation um, in MLA style, right? But basically what you need to do is know what kinds of sources you have and you can find the format for them, right? So let's say I have, I want to look for in-text citations, right? So I click on MLA in-text citations and they give me general guidelines um and the author page style that we were looking at earlier right wordsworth 263 they even give us two ways to do this if you wanted to put the author's name in the sentence and the page number in the parentheses they give us all kinds of different stylistic options right and then they give us various types of sources that you might have and how to format the in-text citations for each so we see in-text citations for print sources with known author, right? Corporate author, non-standard labeling systems, and they give us an explanation of the guidelines and the examples for each one. So all I have to do is know what kind of source I have, right? Like let's say I know that I have a source uh, that is a screenplay. And I have no idea where to begin with that, right? It gives us an example of how to format the quote and also how to provide the citation, right? We see that it's giving us like the line numbers, right? Um, or if I know that I have sources from the internet, it gives me the guidelines for that. Thank you so much for hopefully enjoying and learning from this workshop. Um, I want to emphasize that we're always happy at the Writing Center to work with you on the citation. So if you have a paper that you're happy with, but you have a lot of questions about whether you're citing it appropriately, or you want to dig into some of the ins and outs with, outs with somebody, maybe work through navigating the OWL at Purdue, um, please don't hesitate to make an appointment with us to talk a little bit more about plagiarism and citation. It's a complex topic. But ultimately, once you get into the rhythm of it, um, it can become like muscle memory. And so it's not that scary. Thank you again. Hopefully this was helpful and happy writing.